and the duty of a state or a government is to uh, rule uh, people uh, politically and, and socially. But they are, they are two different entities. But in Islam, they are the same. Well, you know, it's very easy even for you to, uh, to observe that in what is going on in Iran today. The unrest in Iran is the result of this kind of system. And people uh, in that uh, country, in that nation, has, they have become uh, fed up with, uh, with this kind of system, a system that controls the, you know, all, their, their as, all aspects of, of their life. And then we studied Islam's beliefs, the, the iman, and practices the deen as a way of life. And you remember in, uh, in Islam's beliefs, and I'm repeating this for the sake of those of you who were not here. So in Islam's beliefs, we, we studied um, Islam's belief about God, angels, the holy books, prophets, the day of judgment, and uh, pre predestination. And then in Islam's practices, we, we covered uh, the recitation of the word of witness, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, um, and, and uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. So I just want you to keep all these things in mind as we proceed. We also studied Islam's doctrine and understanding on uh, salvation, the meaning of salvation, who God is, who man is, humanity, the problem of uh, sin, uh, the need for redemption, the will of Allah, um, and how Muslims view the doctrine of salvation. And what we discovered from uh, the doctrine of Islam about salvation is even though they believe in Christ, even though they believe in the birth of Jesus Christ, but they don't believe that uh, human beings need a savior, that human beings need a redeemer because uh, sin is not uh, a problem to the extent of requiring a mediator or requiring a redeemer. Man uh, naturally, uh, originally, was created um, as, as uh, an innocent uh, creature. Uh, if there is sin today in the life of human beings, it's because of uh, some kind of wrongdoing that people do in their life. But sin is not really um, uh, a way of separation, separation of God and man. So we don't need a savior. We don't need a redeemer. What we really need to do is, you know, we need to do a uh, few uh, good works uh, depending on the mercy of God at the end of the day. If God wants to have mercy on anyone or any person, he will have mercy anyway. So at the end of the day, you remember the word that I shared with you? Inshallah. At the end of the day, the will of God will be prevailed. It doesn't matter what you do, what you don't do. Of course, you, you, should, you should do good things. Uh, then when God measures uh, your bad deeds and your good deeds, and if your good deeds becomes more, more than your bad deeds, uh, then based on the mercy of God, you will go to heaven. But, you know, all depends on the mercy of God. Remember, the Bible says if anyone believes in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he will be saved. So what we discovered about Islam and its doctrine of salvation is there is no, there is no assurance of salvation and assurance of God's love in Islam. Islam will never give you any kind of assurance any kind of certainty uh, to, for you to go uh, to, to, to heaven. So let me read uh, Matthew 24 for us from Matthew 24, verse 23 to 28. And I, I, I want to relate this with uh, today's uh, session or study where Jesus said, then if anyone says to you, look, here is, here is Christ or there he is, 
Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the, the vultures will, uh, will gather. So Jesus already have warned his people. He has uh, given us a warning that uh, false uh, prophets and false Christs will come. And they, they are, their goal and their mission will be to deceive people. And they will point people to a person that they claim to be Christ. And Jesus here is saying, when you hear them saying that to you, when you, when you see their fingers uh, point, pointing uh, you to someone whom they claim to be Christ, don't listen to them. And don't, don't go to any place where they want you to go. They are false prophets and they are false uh, Christs. And now, this morning, I want to point out to you that Islam uh, does uh, the same thing. I think here our Lord Jesus Christ even though he doesn't mention it by name, but uh, as far as he mentions uh, false Christ and sp false prophets, uh, I think he is pointing us to one of these false religions that we call Islam. Now, this morning, uh, we'll look into the misunderstanding of Islam about the gospel. We already studied the misunderstanding about salvation, and this morning, about the gospel. And this is what you want to know about Islam and Muslims in general. There is usually no lack of opportunity for you to speak about uh, your faith with Muslims. Muslims, by their own nature, they love to talk about their own religion. Especially the modern Muslims, they will never stop you from uh, talking to them about religion because they want you to know about Islam. They want to, know to de they want to defend their own religion. They want to make Islam known to you as a religion, as, as a system, as a way of life. And there you have uh, your own opportunity to uh, share the gospel with them and to point them to Christ. However, before you engage Muslims into a conversation about the gospel, you need to be aware of uh, Muslims' misunderstanding about Christianity. And you need to seek to remove those confusion, those understanding from their minds so that they will have an, an accurate, accurate picture of what we believe. Now, every time you share the gospel with Muslims, you have to make this your goal or your responsibility in order to help them to get the message of the gospel clearly. You need to understand and, and be aware of terms and words and uh, um, doctrines, um, with which and with what they, they, uh, they, they always come, uh, become confused very easily. For example, the term atonement, uh, the term sanctification, the term trinity uh, needs a lot of explanation from Muslims. You can't just sit with a Muslim and say, let's talk about Trinity. You need to explain what, what you mean by it. So I will point out to you this morning five misunderstandings 
of Muslims about Christianity. The first one is that Christians believe in three gods and that the Trinity for Muslims is composed of God, Mary, and Jesus. So for any Muslim, Trinity means God himself and then Mary and then Jesus, not God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. You need to remember that. Uh, that's that's uh, blasphemy. Uh, that's um, a very serious sin in, in, in the eyes of God. For them, Trinity is composed of God, Mary, and Jesus. So the subject of Trinity should not usually be raised when talking to a Muslim about the Christian faith. Now let me clarify one thing for you. I'm not saying that the discussion of Trinity should be avoided. You should never avoid discussing Trinity with Muslims. After all, you know, what's Great Commission? Great Commission is about the triune God. And every time you discuss the, the Son, the Savior, the, the, the Redeemer, the Mediator, you have to come back to Trinity. You have to come back to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. So you can't really avoid the Father and the, uh, the Spirit uh, from your discussion of salvation or the gospel with Muslims. What I'm saying is, you know, the, the, the moment you, you meet a Muslim, don't take up Trinity as a subject of discussion. Uh, they will be confused and you will not achieve much. So you have to be very wise. But if they ask about it, you should not, be, you should not avoid discussing the doctrine of Trinity. For example, if, if a Muslim, your coworker or uh, a Muslim whom you know from the neighborhood comes and he asks you, I, I want to understand the doctrine of Trinity. Teach me or help me to understand that doctrine. Then you should uh, definitely help them with uh, the doctrine of Trinity. And if that opportunity uh, presents itself to you, this is how we should handle uh, you teaching them about the doctrine of Trinity. First of all, start with the oneness of God. The unity of God is highly important for Muslims. What Muhammad did when he established Islam as a religion was he rejected all other gods. He rejected um, po polytheism and he established and maintained a religion of monotheism. And Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is huge for Muslims. They always quote this verse. And they tell you, remember what God told the people of Israel, that God is one. He is not divided. So divided. So the unity of God against uh, polytheism is very important for them. God is uncaused. God is undivided. And when you discuss uh, Trinity or God with them, uh, give them that assurance. Tell them that's what the Bible teaches and that's what I believe. God is one. So show them that any discussion on the Trinity has nothing to do with the number of gods. You need to remind them, you need to tell them, hey, my friend, we are not talking about three gods. We are talking about God. Yes, God is one. Every time we discuss Trinity with the Muslims, we need to tell them, hey, we are not making a reference to the number of gods. We don't have three gods, we have one God. But, with, but we are discussing about the nature of God, the essence of God, the being of God. So you need to take all these terms with you. You know, when you discuss Trinity with the Muslims.
My friend, we are not talking about how many gods, the, you know, the number of gods, but we are talking about the nature of God. Because you remember what I told you about the, the belief of God. God is um, an absolute um, holy but also tran- transcendent. He is a very remote God. Muslims believe that God is untouchable. God uh, will never be experienced by anyone. But the Bible teaches us that we can experience God. We can know God. We can have communion with God. We can have fellowship with our God. I mean, this morning we'll worship together and we'll worship the triune God. We'll worship one God who expressed himself in three persons. But, you know, the whole morning we will have fellowship with our God. We will have communion with our God through prayer, through singing, um, and in the evening through the sacrament. That's not who God is for Muslims. You see, they need Christ. They need the true and the living God. They need to experience God because they, they always live in fear of God, this remote and distant God. That's why they don't have the assurance of salvation. So uh, when you talk about the nature of God, you, you should emphasize that Mary is not part of the Godhead. So tell them, you know, remove Mary uh, from uh, Trinity. You know, Mary is not part of the Godhead. She was the mother of Jesus. She was uh, chosen by God to be the instrument of bringing Christ to the world. But that the Bible shows this one God revealing himself as Father, as Son, as Spirit. So when he helped them with Trinity... Make sure that they understand that you are speaking about one God. One God, but uh, the the, the one God who reveals himself in three persons as Father, as Son, as as, as Spirit. I think a very helpful term that you can use with Muslims is Creator, Word, and Spirit. And I, I'll tell you why. Because God as a creator is so huge, so big for Muslims. So you will not have any problem with introducing God as creator Muslims. Because he is the creator. And then word, for Muslims, the word of God is eternal. Where the problem comes is when they discuss the Quran. When they discuss the Quran, you see the Quran is eternal. For Muslims. The Quran has been in heaven from eternity. It was preserved, you see, for Muhammad, uh, right with God in heaven. So if they complain to you about uh, the plurality of God, you can always challenge the Muslims by saying, you know what, you have the same plurality in, in Islam. You believe that the word is eternal. You believe God is eternal. And you believe the Quran is eternal. So you have this pluralism even in Islam. And then you can explain your trinity uh, to them. But they are always confused about even their own, you know, know, um, idea of uh, trinity. So creator, word, spirit. Make sure that you tell them that it doesn't mean that God changed himself from one thing to another. He always existed in these three ways. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, uh, the expression Son of God is used of Christ refers to a merely carnal relationship in which God took a wife and produced a son. You see, every time we use the term the son of God, in the mind of Muslims, it is religious idolatry. 
In their mind, it is God taking a wife and producing a son. So that's the big misunderstanding. So every time you, t you use the term the son of God, you need to remember that uh, they will be confused about that. So how do, how do you help a Muslim to understand what we mean by uh, the son of God? The, the expression son of God does not refer to, to the physical coming of Christ. And by that what I mean is God taking a wife and producing a son. That, that's not what the Bible means. That's not what we mean when we call Jesus the son of God. But to the eternal relationship that Jesus had with God who is called father. So bring them to the eternality of the Son. And this eternal relationship between the Father and Son. You remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of John? I and the Father are one. If you see me, you see the Father. No one has seen God but the, His Son who has been with Him eternally. He, he made Him known to us. So remember those verses and help them to understand what you mean by the Son of God when you make a reference to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Mary was simply the human agent by which Jesus was introduced into the world. So help them to understand the incarnation. Help them to understand that incarnation doesn't mean that God took a wife and produced a son. You see, in their mind, Christ was created. Remember? In their mind, Christ was created. Christ is a good prophet, a good teacher. He never died. He never atoned the sin of anyone. Uh, Allah took him to heaven before he died. So he never experienced death. death. He, he never died. He is in heaven now, and God is going to send him back again to the world, and I told you the purpose, why the Father or God is going to send Jesus back to the world to correct Christians about their misunderstanding of the Messiah. So he will come back as a great evangelist for Islam. That's what they believe, deep in their heart and deep in their mind. So every time you use the term the Son of God, you should remember all these things. Um, but even if this is understood by the Muslim to whom you are talking, the basic problem uh, for Muslims is Jesus was created and he, uh, he, is, he was created, but he is also, he, he is not, um, a redeemer who atones for the sins of the people of God. So the issue, the issue between you and the Muslim is not the Bible. It's not, you know, it's not the Bible. It's not the word of God. The issue between you and the Muslim is Jesus. You should always remember that. It's not even Trinity. I mean, Trinity is, uh, is denied by, uh, by, by all Muslims, by, by Islam, of course, and it's, it's blasphemy, it's, uh, it's a serious sin in, in the sight of God, that's true, but in your conversation with Muslims about the gospel, the, the burning issue between the two of you is Jesus. For Muslims, God expresses his eternal word within the created world through the book called the Quran. Most Muslims call the Quran the eternal word of God. For Christians, God expresses his, his eternal word within the created world through a person called Jesus. The Bible speaks about the eternal word of God becoming flesh, the man, Jesus. Now you see the difference. For them, for them, the Quran is the eternal word of God. 
and it's expressed in the Quran itself. That's what Muhammad uh, told them, and that's what they believe. For us, you see, God speaks to us through his word. But you come to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, where the writer of the Hebrews tells us, uh, but um, um, in, in the final days, at, at the end of the days, uh, God, the Father, spoke to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. So for us, the eternal word is Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The eternal word, Jesus himself. For them, it's not Christ, it's the Quran. So as you work through this with a Muslim, avoid saying that Jesus is God. Not because it's not true, but I will confuse them. Instead, uh, because it gives them the impression that we make Jesus into another God besides God. So you need to help them to understand that that's not what you are doing. And we mean that God's eternal word came to have a human life among people as Jesus Christ, as Savior and Messiah. So that's how you should handle the term the Son of God. Go to the eternality of God, uh, bring them to the New Testament where the Bible shows them that Christ is God. And thirdly, that the death of Christ would have been an unworthy ending to his life and is not necessary to provide forgiveness of sins. First, first of all, remember, he never died, but when they talk about our understanding of Christ, and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, they say it was unworthy ending to his life. Muslims reject the doctrine of atonement. First, historically, he was not crucified on the cross. So they, they deny history, they reject history. They reject the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then they say no need for atonement if God wants to forgive he simply uh, forgives. So the doctrine of atonement, for us it's central. You see, no atonement, no salvation. No atonement, no forgiveness of sins. No atonement, no uh, reconciliation with the Holy God. That's the Christian faith. That's what we believe and that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the prophets taught or proclaim it, and that's what the apostles taught, and what, that's what Jesus taught. But for Muslims, you see, uh, that's not necessary. Humanity does not need an atoning sacrifice. God works uh, through such as prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Um, they can atone for a person's sin, but now listen to this. Even if these good works are not enough. God is merciful, and so Muslim, Mo, Muslims hope that in the Lord's day, on the judgment day, God may overlook his failings. They are lost. They depend on their own works, but at the same time, they don't trust their own works, which is a good thing. For, for you, for your conversation with them, you can always tell them, you're doing the right thing. You know, don't trust your good works. Isaiah says they are like a filthy rag. So you need uh, the righteousness that comes from God. And we'll talk about that tonight. You can take notes, good notes from tonight's sermon and use it uh, in your witnessing to, uh, to Muslims. Show them that any... Uh, fair reading of the New Testament. Now remember, they believe in the New Testament. They knew they believe in the Gospels. So you will not have any problem to bring uh, the Gospel, the Gospels, in your conversation with the Muslims. Uh, as far as they agree with them, they accept them. When they don't disagree with them, they reject them. So that's the behavior of any Muslim with uh, the Gospels, even though they call them. Um, 
um, the gospel or, or in, uh, angel, but uh, the gospel is for us, can be um, a tool for your conversation with any Muslim. So tell them uh, that any fair reading of the New Testament shows that the death and resurrection of Christ are central to the New Testament message. So ask them, my friend, how, would you de- how could you deny atonement? How could you deny uh, re- the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its purpose? Because it's, it's all over in the New Testament. He came to die. He puts an end to all other sacrifices. And they are big with sacrifices and point them to the sacrifices in the Old Testament and and remind them that Christ came and he brought all these sacrifices to an end and he became a final Passover, a final sacrifice for sin. Don't you uh, need that? Don't you need to have a sacrifice like that? Um, Christ does assures us of our forgiveness by faith not by depending on our own works. So bring the gospel offer to uh, your Muslim friend, a uh, Muslim who is in conversation with you, and tell them Christ does reveals uh, the, the horror of sin and the righteousness of God. Tell them, you know, when Christ died on the cross, two things were revealed to humanity. One was the horror of sin. The misery of sin, the consequence of sin, the problem of sin, the wrath of God on sin. You know, you need to bring all these truths to their mind as a picture before their eyes. This is why he died, because of sin. But, you know, the cross also is a picture of God's mercy and God's love and God's forgiveness Not based on good works, but based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how you proclaim the gospel to to the Muslims. And fourthly, um, and this is very interesting because it's, it's all over the world, that Christianity is a Western religion. That was our experience back home. When the government closed churches in Eritrea and they started taking believers to prison. And the first time I went to prison, even my wife and members of our churches, the first, the first thing that we heard from our captors was the religion where you are in today is a religion from the West. That's what they told us. You have got a religion in your own country. You have got the Coptic Church. You have got the Catholic Church. You have got the, you know, historic Evangelical Lutheran Church. Why do you need this religion? This is from the West. And if your captor happens to be a Muslim, this will be um, expanded more in his conversation uh, with you. So, in the mind of the Muslims, you see, it's the same. And the reason is, in the mind of most Muslims, because the followers of Christianity are mainly found in the Western countries, and their actions represent Christianity. Christianity must be a religion from the West. Well, sadly, that's not the case today. In most cases, our actions doesn't represent Christianity today, something that we need to pray about. It's gone. It's declining. It's in crisis. But uh, the first time American missionaries came to, Ameri- to Eritrea, I remember, they, sta- they planted and established um, uh, the Methodist Church in Eritrea. It, you know, we, we, uh, we used to call it uh, Faith Mission Church. And, and, and my father would tell me, wow, this man represents God. They represent Christianity. And these were from America. You know, 
your own, um, you know, fathers in the faith. And um, sadly, that's not the case today. But, you see, in the mind of Muslims, uh, it's, it's a religion from the West. Some countries where Christians are persecuted for their uh, Christian uh, faith uh, maintains this kind of view. As we have already uh, observed, Islam for uh, the Muslim is a total system having important national, social, and political implications. And it is very easy for the Muslim to regard Christianity in the same way. The same way that he understands his own religion. You know, Islam should rule and control all aspects of life. The life of the individual person, the life of the social life of the people, the political life of the people, not only on a national level, but even internationally. Why, why do you think uh, extreme Muslims come to America and attack the nation? Or they go to some other places and they are, because internationally, you see, this world is supposed to be a world of Islam. That's the goal. Uh, that's the system. That's the teaching. You see, that's what they, they, they believe. Um, when, um, when they are Christ, um, they call it Madi. When Madi comes, when Madi comes, he will uh, execute all people who will, who will refuse to become Muslims. And when, when the Mahdi comes, you see the Christ of Islam. When the Mahdi comes, he will come uh, having black flag. Have you noticed that the, the Ira Iranian uh, soldiers, they always have black flags. They represent the Mahdi. And if you are uh, infidel, if you are not a, Mos a Muslim, they execute you. That's what ISIS is doing. They represent the Mahdi. And every time you see the uh, black flag, you know, they are, they are waiting for the coming of the Mahdi. They represent the Mahdi. And their action represents his action. If you refuse to become a Muslim, they kill you. So, that's, that's the system, that's the way of life. How, and how do we remove this confusion from the mind of the Muslims? I, and I will finish with that one. First, we deal uh, with, with the origin of Christianity. Tell them, uh, Jesus Christ was born in Palestine. Tell them, oh, Jesus was not born in the UK. Jesus was not born in Washington, D.C. Jesus was born in Palestine. And every Muslim who hears that goes, oh. So, so that idea of, you know, Christianity uh, being a Western religion will go away from their mind if they hear to you uh, very uh, seriously and, and attentively. And, and um, it was there where... Christianity organized, and Palestine, Palestine is the land that, that joins uh, the great um, continents of Asia, Africa, e Europe, and it was from there, using the famous Roman roads and trade routes, that the Christian uh, message was able to spread rapidly in all directions. And that's history. You need to bring that history to them. You see, my friend, this is where Christianity began. This is where Christianity was organized. But we must also point out that the, the true essence of Christianity is spiritual and primarily concerns our relationship with God. So you have to be very, very firm, clear, and purposeful with Muslims in regard to that. Tell them, you know, we are not about history. We are not about origin. You know, we are about man's relationship with God. 
That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of the, the Bible. That's what God wants to see in the life of his children, having a relationship with him. So my friend, do you want to have a relationship with God? And if they say yes, and then you point them to the man, Christ, through whom they can have uh, a living uh, relationship, a living uh, communion with uh, Christ. For Muslims, the Quran is superior to the gospel uh, records because the gospel, the, 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 the angel, um, are mostly narrative. So the Quran becomes superior because it's a d direct revelation from Allah. But the gospels are narratives. In general, Muslims are quite willing to read the scriptures, especially the gospel records. So when we engage Muslims in a conversation about Christianity, the real issue is not authority and the integrity of the Bible. It is Christ as the Savior of sinners. And the purpose of scriptures is to lead man to Christ. There is no salvation in scriptures themselves. Take this to the Muslims. You know, you are not saved by reading the scriptures. You are not saved by believing a, cer a certain, certain book is eternal. You are saved by believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let me quote this verse to all of you, John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, Jesus said, because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they thy, that they bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Use this verse when you converse with Muslims. Because the Quran is the way to eternal life, the way to heaven for them. So read this verse to them and tell them, this is what Jesus said. You will never have eternal life by believing in this, by, by believing uh, only in the scriptures, but believing in uh, the person to whom the scriptures points to you, and he is Jesus Christ. So always pray as Muslims read the scriptures that they might be led to Christ, the Savior. And they read the scriptures. They read the scriptures. But always pray as a believer that when they keep reading the scriptures, that the scriptures, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will lead them to Christ. So, I will conclude uh, this morning class here. Um, I can give you one or two minutes for, for questions, if you have any questions. Uh, but we'll continue and hopefully uh, conclude our class on Islam next Sunday. Ben. I would use the Nicene Creed when the opportunity presents itself to me and a Muslim comes to me and asks me, I want seriously, you know, I want to understand the Trinity. I, I want to study uh, the doctrine of Trinity seriously. I'm very uh, concerned about my, my belief, concerned about my salvation. Yeah, I would encourage you to use the Nicene Creed. But in your early conversation, conversation with Muslims, if you go to the Nicene Creed and you try to use it for them, uh, the first thing that they will realize is, you know, in their mind, is you are going away from the scriptures. So they will ask you, why are, why are you not using the Bible? What is this creed, you know? Why, what is this you know, Nicene Creed? Uh, a creed that was written by man. Um, so you need to be wise and choose the right time to use uh, our creeds in your witnessing to, to the Muslims. I mean, those of you who have been at the Christmas party at the apartment with the Kashians and the, the Muslim families, those of you who came uh, from, from the Dimar, 
Uh, you remember, you know, just reading the story of the birth of Jesus Christ right from the Bible, from the Gospels to them was a big thing. And they were listening to Chris attentively and they were happy. You know, the only time that one of them nodded his head was when Christ, when Chris read Matthew 1 21 and his name will be Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. And he was like, what? Right? Yeah. That's the issue. But the story was wonderful for them. Chris had no problem. No one walked out. No one was unhappy. Everyone was happy, including us. Of course. Bill. Say it again. Not, not all Muslims. Uh, I, th I think the, uh, the teachers of their religion and, and devout most Muslims who go to the mosque uh, every day, who read, read the Quran every day, can be familiar with the sacrifice in the Old Testament. W when I was in Kenya, you know, uh, one day I was talking to a Muslim, uh, a Muslim man uh, whom I met at the bank in Nairobi. And uh, when I started talking about Moses and the giving of the law and uh, the sacrifices, he had no clue what I was talking about. What sacrifices? Where are they? You know? Why do people sacrifice? You know, these this, uh, bulls and animals? He had no idea what I was talking about. So not all Muslims. Rich. Muhammad encouraged them to read, uh, to read the gospel. Uh, they, they consider it as, as one book, um, which I have no problem with that. It, it's the gospel about Jesus Christ. It's the gospel, the good news of salvation. Uh, he encouraged them to read uh, the gospel, uh, but if you, if you read his instructions carefully, he did that. Uh, with one exhortation, one clear instruction to all Muslims, uh, you read the Gospels and you believe in them or you take them as truths uh, only when they agree with the Quran. If they don't agree with the Quran, what I told you, you reject them. So, so you know, Muslims have no problem with you know, reading the Gospels. The problem is with the, act, the actual message of the Gospel. And then it needs to be rejected. Every time Christ is presented as the Redeemer, he needs to be rejected. Uh, okay, final question. Always shocked. Yeah. Um, and I think I mentioned, I already mentioned it that to all of you. You know, every time you uh, challenge them about that, don't criticize uh, Muhammad's good works for Islam, but just ask them where is Muhammad in the Bible as a prophet? Simple, you know, but humble argument. You know, my friend showed me where is Muhammad in the Bible. You know, and he's nowhere in the Bible. So that, that's, that's a good question. Um, Bill, would you pray for us? Yes, I'll be glad to. Yeah. Loving Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and you have given the revelation of yourself through your word that you have caused the men of the to speak as they were moved by God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this comfort that we have. We thank you for the Lord.
Lord Jesus, for what he has done for us. We thank you for this message, and we ask that you make us good witnesses about you and about your mercy. Prepare us now to worship you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 